So we have nothing we discussed prior. So it's just literally straight book today. We are on it today. Welcome Good job to pressing December. the record button. Welcome to December. It's already a Good shit show. Pressing the I'm, s- I'm sick. I forgot to hit the record button because I paused it because um. I was doing other shit. And it's my fault. <laughs> you win the internet today. I win the internet every day. Not that you want to know about our lives. Anyways, let's find out about other people's lives today. So today... We are talking about the lives of Rage and Press. Today, we are discussing, honestly, I'm totally faking it, by Amanda Gamble. Which is how I live my life. I mean, solid. True facts. So, yes, honestly, I'm totally faking it features Rage, our female main character, 24, and Press, our main male character, 28. This is a rom-com kind of fake dating forced proximity i want to say romance and it is in a single first person pov this entire book is in rachel's point of view though i'm going to be completely honest and i missed opportunity yeah i truly wish i had the main male characters point of view but we'll get there so honestly i'm totally faking it starts out with Rach, and she has been crashing on her ex, JD's couch. Her apartment is being fumigated, and her ex is, to put it lightly, a douche, but he's letting her stay on his couch while she needs a place. Not for free, by the way. She's basically kind of a live-in maid for him. Yeah. She's doing his laundry, she's cooking, she's cleaning up, she's doing all kinds of stuff. She's basically um, doing girlfriend house. things for a man. I don't like that term because I don't think girlfriends should have to do their no, laundry I'm just or stating, clean their like houses. She, or... No, I know. I'm just stating if I wasn't she's dating being his maid, and he ain't doing anything for her in return. They've been on and off again for a while, um, but they're off currently, and she feels like he might be trying to get on with her again because there's all these cutesy little notes on food left in the fridge. And she feels like he has been very kind, letting her stay on the couch and all this stuff. And then the morning of her birthday, there's a lingerie set laid out on the bathroom counter. And Honestly, she thinks that all perfect thought process. She thinks that, oh my goodness, he, after all these years, he finally remembered my birthday because he hasn't in the past. But this year, when we're not together, he finally remembered my birthday and left me lingerie on the bathroom counter. And it's so green she, and it like matches her eyes. Oh, she's so excited. It's not the right size at all, but she thinks he tried his best. So she's very excited. She pr- puts on the lingerie right away. Like I said, it does not fit but she's wearing it anyways because he did that for her. And she takes this as a sign from the universe that they are meant to be together and that he wants her. She tries to go talk to him to thank him for it, but his bedroom door is locked. But she thinks that is just his way of, you know, sleeping in and, you know, letting her have a peaceful morning to herself and not ruining the surprise of the evening. So at the office where she works as an assistant to the assistants. Her office is in a flurry. There is a buzz around the whole place about this asshole of a guy who changes assistants more than he changes underwear. At least he changes his underwear. I bet you this man does not leave it on the floor. Honestly, I bet you he does not, knowing, now that we know him. <laughs> Another reason why no, having his point of view would have been crucial. I know. <laughs> so everyone is really frustrated over this client of their company because it's this big shot. He's a very important client, but they cannot keep him matched with an assistant. He fires them constantly. He's very picky. He likes things just so, and they're at the point where they're in a meeting and the boss is begging 
for someone to volunteer to be the next assistant. And they have added all kinds of incentives to get try somebody to, entice, to volunteer for to, it. To try to entice <laughs> someone, anyone, anybody. Except for the one person who, when hearing all these incentives, decides to give it a shot. And then they're even condescending to Rach, who volunteers, and doesn't think she's up to par to be able to handle Listen, that. Listen, her entire work environment, everybody fucking sucks. I hate all they of them. They were so toxic. No, None of them know her name. They're just so toxic. No, they didn't know her. All of them sucked. I hate them all. Hate them all. And they had no confidence in her workability. She didn't have a lot of confidence at work either. With no one else willing to volunteer, they agree that she can try until a suitable replacement is found. So he is feeling large and in charge and so happy to have this birthday be going well. She is getting back together with her ex. He remembered her birthday for once. She got a big promotion at work. She got a new opportunity to succeed. She is on top of the world. Nothing can bring her down. Well, except for when she gets home and the woman who the laundry actually belongs to steps out of JD's bathroom naked from the shower because obviously that's how this book is going to go. Because don't you forget, I told you in the beginning, the main male character is Press, not JD. So if you thought that this is how this was going to go, you weren't paying attention. This is not a reverse harem situation. <laughs> no. <laughs> as much as Ariel might want it to be. Not or any JD. orgies. None of it's going on. Mm, okay. <laughs> so, sad, big fat sad. JD does not want her. Landre is not hers. And the woman asks for it back. It's not going well. So she needs to get the fuck out of there. Yeah. So luckily, good timing. She gets a call from a coworker who needs her to run an errand for her. The coworker needs her to pick up a spare dress from a dry cleaner and zoom it over to some big party. And she does it, of course, and she's ready. And she's having a hard time getting into this party because the man at the door does not have her on the list. And she's trying to explain to him, like, I'm not trying to get into this party. I'm just trying to deliver this dress to somebody who's at this party. I was asked to do this. Can I just do this? And they're going back and forth. And he's getting all, you know, and she's like getting frustrated. She's like, I don't have time for this. And the man behind her is sighing and getting impatient. And he's so impatient that he's just like, she's with me. Can we just get in now? And why didn't you just say so? And then let's go. So they go in and she says, oh, thank you so much. You know, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no problem. All good. And so she finds the assistant that called her for help and she finds the lady. Well, come to find out. The shoes don't match the dress that she brought. So now the lady needs her shoes too. They just need to take and take and take and take from this woman. Crazy. It's not going well. So now it's her birthday. She's shoeless and boyfriendless and lingerie and things are not looking up. She borrows a pair of shoes from the lost and found and decides that, you know what? It's an open bar. She's going to have a drink on her birthday. So she grabs that drink and heads out into the back alley just to have some space. She's very surprised when the back door opens again and that same man who rescued her and let her in comes out trying to sneak a smoke break. And every time she said her name to the doorman, once again, no one cared who she was or what she had to say. So he kept calling her Ruth. So when the gentleman comes back to the alley and sees her, he calls her Ruth too, because that's what the doorman called her. And she chooses not to correct him because, I mean, I don't even correct people saying my name wrong these days. I mean, that, and this man doesn't know her, so she might as well just be like, you know what, fuck it, I'm Ruth for the night. Well, but it just doesn't matter enough to her to correct it right now. And he introduces himself. He says, my name's Press. And 
they have a good conversation. But then she realizes that he thinks she's one of the guests. So she decides to really take on this Ruth persona <laughs> and it's kind of really takes it up a notch. And he doesn't have his lighter on him, but luckily she has a pair of matches and she helps him out. And he's like, oh, I owe you one. You know, just typical banter back and forth. And it's her birthday. She's feeling this Ruth persona. And, I mean, this is the most beautiful man she's seen in a while. So she asks him if he'd like to... <laughs> Take her back to his house. For just one night. Just one yeah. night. Let's just have one night. And before he can answer, the door swings open again. By the most infuriating man I've ever met. So this alpha douche nozzle tells him he needs to get back people are waiting and he has people he used to see so unfortunately you know the moment's gone and she heads back to the office where she's going to spend the night lonely because she can't head back to her jd's couch right now yeah. but that's okay because the next morning she gets to start work for the new guy yeah um, she's excited she's ready to fucking go she's even researched this guy he's this old senator dude He's not a very nice senator, but it's okay. Everyone says he's only in town for one week max out of the month. He's got yeah, he's this. not around very so often. Basic, so. Yeah, so she's basically going to be uh, working out of his penthouse alone, and it's going to be awesome. My favorite so, thing, too, has throughout this has been like her just like one-off comments that are funny, because she is funny. And someone was like, yeah, he's here. She's like, oh, so you only... It was like a percentage of the month and they're like looking at her like she's fucking insane because she's like, yeah, you only have to deal with them for this many times. And they're like, what? No. She's just trying to make the best of a bad situation. Especially right. if this she's dude is a douchebag. Very optimistic. And no one has a sense of humor. But I feel like she also is very neurodivergent. So it was very easy to... <laughs> oh, y'all resonated. So she's already getting emails from this guy. They're going back and forth. She's trying to set up his calendar. It looks like things have been quite a mess from the old person. Yeah, the previous um, assistant sucked, basically. Yeah. And was, like, color coordinating things that didn't make literally any sense to color coordinate. And his schedule, everything's a fucked up mess. Yeah. And first day on the job, she's trying her best to try to, like, situate it out. And... The problem is, though, that while she's trying to juggle all these emails, she misses the bus to get to the penthouse because she's focusing on her phone and the emails. So I relate so hard. Yeah. <laughs> and it's pouring and she's soaking wet by the time she gets there. And she's supposed to have an interview with the cleaners because one of her first tasks is he wants her to find a new cleaning company for his place because he doesn't like the chemicals that the last one used and the last assistant just can't seem to get it through her thick skull. It was just funny. She goes, this place is fucking spotless. Who the fuck am I going to hire to clean this? Right. So she's all worried about interviewing cleaners looking like a drowned fucking rat. And she's been told she'd have this place to herself. So... She probably shouldn't have, but she decides to use one of his showers and clean herself up a bit before the interview. But then when she gets out and she starts trying to get redressed again, she's really confused because she hears talking. Did a TV get turned on or something? Like, that's so weird. And she goes to the room that the talking is in to go turn off the TV. Yeah, it's not the TV. My um, favorite part is the comments she makes as she's coming out. And it's so funny. And this is what happens is boob gate happens. And I'm dying, by the way, when I'm reading this. I'm like, this is so embarrassing because it's on camera and her boobs are out. She's naked and she covers herself real quick. But this shit's caught on camera forever. It's so fucking funny. I would die. There's also only so much you can cover with your hands. When the towel drops. So live television, it's not like he can just redact that or anything. So he has to be quick on his feet. And, you know, he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Excuse me. My girlfriend and I are still trying to get our schedules figured out. And 
give me a minute kind of thing, and they go off into the other room. So funny story, her new boss is not a 60-year-old dude senator. It's press. He's hot. Imagine that. I knew where this was going. I feel like it would have been even more funny if it was the old dude. Uh, of course you do, because you have daddy things. I No, stop it. It's <laughs> so gross. Please don't call it that. No, I'm just saying it would have probably shocked you a little bit more, actually, if it had been the 60-year-old guy. They'd be like, guess what? It's not going to be the 60-year-old. Like, Surprise, bitch, it is. So he is not happy. He thinks she's, like, stalking him or something. He's like, how'd she get there? She's trying to explain to him, like, no, I'm your new assistant. She's trying to explain to him the whole situation. And they go back and forth. He's like, well, obviously, you're fired. And then his phone starts blowing up because boob gate. And it is literally everywhere. And he just called her his girlfriend on live television. So they realize that it's probably not quite as easy as just extraditing her right then and there. And she kind of pulls the you owe me one line uh, from giving him a light that night, which was not the right thing to say, by the way. But... He agrees, fine, we'll wait just a little bit, and then I'm firing you. Wait for this to blow over. Meaning he probably thought it was going to be a couple days and then yeah. firing you. <clears throat> well, So, of course, JD is a prick and a fucking half. And he doesn't believe her. <laughs> well, it's happening. not, well, she had to go back. She, that's where she's staying on the couch or whatever. Mm-hmm. And she only has a couple more days where she has to go back. and. He's just He's kind of like, when did you start ass. dating this guy? Like, he's basically implying that he's completely out of her league. She's not really worthy or enough to be with this powerful man. And, of course, he's like, well, when did you start dating him? And she's like, when we broke up. And, I mean, I believe the girl that he's seeing is there, too. And she goes, she's hot, though. She's got really nice boobs because, of course, now everybody has seen her tits. Which was so interesting that the new girlfriend commented on the ex-girlfriend's boobs, which was well, wild. They were at the house and it was playing on Good Morning America. And yeah. were, all three of them were watching it. That's why. And that's and the, ex, the new girlfriend was saying something about her boobs. And she was shocked. She's like, you're with him, but you're living on a couch? And JD is all like, there's no world where he's her boyfriend. And... The girlfriend's like, but he said so. And JD's like, she's an assistant to assistants. She's not pulling dudes like that. Yeah, he's such a dickhole. And really, it kind of shows you, too, how their relationship went. Oh, yeah. And she's like, boobs out like that have only one message. He was into it. (laughs) And yeah, and he was like super into that shit. And he's like, well, you thought he was an older dude. And Rachel was like, well, he is older than me. This is sad. You can't actually believe this. Horoscopes are one thing, but this is another level. Guys like that don't date girls with no money and no connections. What do you do? Lie about who you were? And he's just, he's a douche and a half. He's just mad because the person who's been doing all his shit is going to be leaving. And the she traded the fuck up. Right. He wants that control over her still and knowing she's on the back burner for him. She gets a text saying, you know, be at my place, coffee, 9.30, let's go, don't be late. And so she has to go. Come to find out, they've run the statistics on this for his likability. He's Um, not likable, by the way, guys. (laughs) If it's any shock, he is not a likable dude. Because this dude, Press, is trying to run for mayor. He's trying to run for mayor of Middleton. And they're trying to pull his likability and all this stuff, and it would not be pretty good if he just dumped a girl who's going viral that he said is his girlfriend and then he dumped her for having her boobs on TV. Yeah, it's um, not a so good look. They <laughs> ran, yeah, they ran the numbers on this and come to find out they need to pretend to be together for four weeks, two days, and around 16 hours. So he needs her to be willing to commit to that and then she can be fired. Then she's so funny because she's like two conditions. She goes, <laughs> I keep my job for longer than four weeks, two days, roughly 16 hours. When we're done, you let me quit. Don't fire me. 
and you give me a job reference. I mean, he needs her. So right? who's really winning here? Yeah. They're struck the deal on the fake dating. I just love a fake dating trope. I know that a lot of people don't. I love it. So good. Yeah. And it's his fault. He's the one who said, oh, my girlfriend, because he fucking panicked. The man who needs to have a plan for literally everything fucking panicked and put himself in this position. But they had a good PR meeting with it. The, the PR lady's pretty funny. And they were pretty kind of clear that he does not pull likable. Um, no. And then people hearing her calling like him an old man and all this other stuff really resonated with people. And it's because she's likable. And so kind of by proxy, it would make him a little bit more likable, but it's only because she's literally saying the things that everybody's fucking thinking. Right. They, they, she pulled as super relatable. So <laughs> I mean, basically his PR lady was like, um, you need to date her. No your, one your really likes you, to this. <laughs> you have a stick shoved so far up your ass. So they start going to events together and it doesn't go very well because they don't fake date very well. And Ethan, his like campaign manager is studied his father's campaign and idolizes it and wants to recreate it when that's not what press wants. So it's weird that it's whatever, not but... even press press is not even that person. But Ethan is so, no. so I have so many words about this motherfucker. Every time he's on book page, I want to punch him through the book. Every time they go to an event, Ethan pulls Rach aside and is basically like stand here and then goes and has press do what he wanted him to do anyway. So they're doing nothing. So basically three bad events later, they finally get into an argument over it. And she's basically like, no one is honest with you. So I'm going to be like, this is the third event where I've been told to stand against a wall and just watch you. When your team isn't sucking up to you, they're terrified of you. Do you realize that? Do you even care on the off chance that you speak to a regular person? You don't connect with them. That regular person, we don't connect. We're not even trying. You're not actually trying to connect to people. And that's what you should be doing. I am a constituent. You're only going to do what you want to do, but... Come on. But she like knows the people and she knows what they want to hear and how they want to be treated. And he's just going based off of because he's so numbers, numbers and statistics and all this other like focus. He's going off of that and then also going off of the advice of fucking Ethan this whole time. Mm -hmm. So it's because they're trying to run him like his dad's campaign. And it's starting to show because he's very disconnected from the shit, the fact that she's like, they're not going to talk. I'm going to talk straight to your face and I'm going to tell you exactly what the fuck is going on. You're being a dumb. So they they argue back and forth until he's finally like, why don't you take tomorrow off? And then they just split ways. And she finally goes home. I think she got fired. Because <laughs> she can go home now, though, because her place is done being fumigated. She can finally go home. She's just glad to go home, especially after this argument. Um, tomorrow off doesn't actually happen because the next morning press is on her doorstep. And she goes, I thought I was Um, fired. You told me to go home. (laughs) He has a new vision and a new plan. And the only way that they are going to make this fake dating work is if they get to know one another and actually work with one another and actually practice with one another. Which honestly, it's a smart idea. Is going to be touching. There is going to be getting to know each other. Like he like takes a tour around her apartment, asks her all kinds of questions. I want to just watch you for a day. I want to get to know you first. She's She's like, well, I was going to go grocery shopping. He's like, I'll go with you. And she's like, yeah, you sure? And so when they go to the grocery store, this man has clearly not been in a grocery store in a long time. And he was all excited to go to the grocery store. It was really cute. She was less. (laughs) I like the way she's like, I need to go get this. Just stay here. And he like fucking panics. And he goes, but, but what if I can find you? It's a, just stand here. Don't go anywhere. It was cute though. It was really cute. But he got to know her on a lot of things. And he is so good at paying attention to things and those small details that 
he was able to collect a lot of information from. Which he did tell her that the best way for him to get to know her isn't even just her telling him the things. It's literally him observing and watching her for a day and he could gather pretty much everything that he needs to know about her from small interactions because he is observant. Well, mostly observant. He's still a man. He, and he's so funny. He's like, I skimmed a couple of books and two podcasts and read some blogs so on fake funny. dating. So I'd like to fix that. <laughs> he's trying. This he put himself true. in this predicament and he is trying. He's just really coming at it very analytically. Not only that, but he's actually taking her advice on the events that he's going to. And instead of just the high profile, high donation donors, He's actually getting put on his schedule events with the community Mm -hmm. as well, which is something she had been saying in meetings and Ethan kept kind of shutting her down like, oh, you don't know anything. Just shut up and know your place kind of thing. Which is wild because she comes from the community. So you would think she would, but you know. She don't know anything. So the first one they go to is a pancake breakfast and Ethan is getting very frustrated with her and he finds her making pancakes at the pancake breakfast because you know weird that you're at an event to volunteer and you're actually volunteering i know that's so weird but she should be getting press coffee and just staying out of things because they should not be at this event yes and he's just being a total douchey douchey nozzle but it's kind of funny because Press comes over and he's basically like, Ethan, why don't you go get me coffee? I love it so much. He puts Ethan right in the fuck in his place. Ah. And they have a really cute moment in front of actually this lady who's kind of important to the community and not a fan of his father where they're super cute over pancakes and Rach does a good job talking to people and connecting with it. And it's their first foray into actually trying this goes really well and they have some good press too which so sable the pr lady is super happy about so they're finally faking it right they're doing a good job working together and doing these events and putting those pieces together and really working towards that community goal and rach even makes him like a vip binder for the community so that he can focus on different people to help his goals within the community and not just those big donor people. So press still after these socially draining events, he still finds himself needing that smoke break afterwards and she joins him. So during this time, they do a lot of talking and they have established a little game that they play with one another after these events and they call it truth chicken. And they have to ask each other questions. And as they answer them, great. They have to tell the truth. But if they don't answer a question or don't fully answer all the way or truthfully or scapegoat around it, they get a point. And press does not want to lose. So they take this game very seriously. So we learn around this time that Rachel's mom is currently in prison and it's for stealing from the wealthy, but she hasn't been in very much contact with her. And that's kind of a focal part of her life because she did not have a very good time growing up. There's a lot of words I could use for her mother. Selfish is the biggest one that comes to mind. And I, I mean, felt like she was mentally unstable. On levels, she was mentally but... unstable. And she was one of those, if it, I guarantee you, if it was an MLM, she was in it. And I mean, it, it oh, is yeah. hinted throughout it too, that she was in a couple of them. Like she oh, did yeah. Tupperware. She did this other thing. And then she'd be like, oh, but now I'm going to do this, but I have to put this money. And it was stuff that she used to try to get ahead in the family stuff. But at the same time, it really felt like her daughter was not ever really at the forefront of her mind and it was super detrimental to the entire family structure and to her it was just but every single time like anything about like her family comes up in truth chicken she 
directs the conversation to something else. Because at the yeah. same time, you know, when they were researching her too, she doesn't have any social media presence, any history that they try to find on her. They, there's nothing there. There's, they just can't find anything. And obviously it's done for a reason. There's a reason she's not on social media. There's a reason there's no real footprint for anything related to her. And yeah. So everything's been going really well for them in the fake dating sense. Um, Sable, the PR lady, is extremely happy with all of the posts and the pictures that have been being taken and all the press and all the publicity around them. But one day press notices that there is a photo on Instagram that he did not approve of. And, and it's a really like, beautiful photo too. And it's, it's such really a cute, but he's like, what the fuck is this? This was a private moment. This was not for the public. This was not a publicity stunt. Why is this on Instagram? Cause they were just in the kitchen, like arguing over an oven mitt that Rach had made and brought to his house to make it a little more lively so that he would have oven mitts. It was just such a cute moment. And then Olivia captured one of, them, his, one of his, one of his people captured the moment. He's more upset that they looked like that in the photo when it wasn't a publicity stunt. I took it to mean more so he knows what they look like in the picture and he wanted that private moment kept to I himself. I thought it was bull. But honestly, okay. I thought it was bull. See, I didn't see it the I didn't see it the other way. I could see why I we... I, th I saw it as him realizing how close they were becoming and yeah. how real like And him and his poor analytical brain can't and... understand. Right. Yeah. So that's why that's how I took that. But truly, they are having a lot of growth and they are having so much connection to one another and they're touchy-feely all the time and it's really a lot. But then Thanksgiving rolls around and it kind of blindsides press because he's just kind of a workaholic and he doesn't realize people stop working for things. So his team in the penthouse consists of Ethan, Olivia, and Jamal plus Rach round the clock all the time um, yeah and then Sable off and on as needed so when all of a sudden Jamal Olivia and Ethan were, were all like peace out for Thanksgiving he was like oh shit he was like Rach you can go take the weekend and she's like no it's okay I can volunteer with you I just assumed I'd be with you it's okay he's like no go with your family I'm sure your mom will be happy to see you go because she has a let it slip the shit about her mom so so now rach is sad and lonely on thanksgiving eating chinese at a chinese place alone. i mean i'm not gonna lie that sounds pretty good yeah it does <laughs> as somebody who's very over full on thanksgiving food yeah it does so of course because this is the universe that rach lives in jd finds her while he's getting takeout from the chinese place which the amount of shit that he gave her for being there he was there too, motherfucker. He just wants just want to, to put her down at any time. Mm -hmm. And he's basically like, oh, I knew you weren't dating him. He wouldn't have left you alone, blah, 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 blah. I mean, and... listen, okay, first of all, fuck you, because it's new. Why would you spend Thanksgiving with someone you just started dating? That's awkward. And because of all the publicity and all that, he's thinking that she might have had a thing with him. So now she could be worthy or something of him because now he's kind of like oh well you know we should go, go get out. a drink yeah and she was just like oh okay the way that press tr has been treating her even fake has been so much better than jd has ever treated her she's realizing even in the way that he's treating her now what could she have ever seen in him in the first place? Yeah. And she's getting some clarity of the situation and really seeing it for what it truly was. And so she's like, okay, sure, I'll meet you. And then when it's time to go back to presses, she asks him for a favor. And she's like you know i'm doing all this fake dating for you do you think you could just one night fake date for me and she kind of explains the situation 
And he's like, you know what? I'm on it. And Press brings his fucking A game to that <sighs> double date. Yeah, he does. Except because it's not a, a double date. Because in her brain, it's a double date. Not but dipshit, it's not. JD literally wanted to fuck her. <laughs> That's the only reason he called her. Both. Oh, it's so funny, though, because like... So yes, JD easy. does not bring that girlfriend with the lingerie. Um, no, he does not. He has his ass basically handed to him by press. Press is like, where's your partner? And he goes, oh, we broke up. I assumed that she knew. And they both looked at her and she's, she I would like, panic. I have a boyfriend. I have a, what the fuck is wrong with you? Oh, it's so good. It was a great scene. He really stuck it to JD on many levels. Made JD feel about this big. It was great. And the pub where they were at was having a trivia night. And as you know, he's very competitive. Very competitive. And Rach is correct on all the answers she tries to answer, but JD puts her down every single time so that they get them wrong because he refuses to let her be right about anything. But Press pushes her on the last question of the night. It's about the Zodiac. Zodiac Come on. Of course she knows this shit. He has been talking about horoscopes literally since she met him jd's arguing that's not the answer and press is like she reads horoscopes every morning and you know if she cares about you she also reads your horoscope every morning so you know all these whether you going, want to whether or you not. want to know it or not <laughs> it was like this impassioned speech too and it was great and he's like write it down right now <laughs> just write it down i believe in it we got this and 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 so so they were right and they win and they smooch he's so excited at winning that he just can't help himself that he kisses her and it's their first kiss and they both are just like a little bit shocked at this point as to what the fuck just happened he kind of is panic on his face and she's just kind of like it's fine there's just adrenaline no worries and JD is basically, after watching this display, congrats. And he pulls out um, a cigarette and he's like, any chance either of you have a light? I left mine in the car. And because he's still on stunned autopilot, Press takes out his lighter and slides it across the table. And JD is now smug again and goes, she hasn't managed to stop you either, huh? Rachel was always trying to get me to quit. We must not be that different after all. I want to do smack that motherfucker across his smug ass motherfucking face. So they all go their separate ways after that. And Rach is really concerned because it's time to go into the office and she hasn't had 20 million emails or texts from press. And she's super concerned. And not only that, but all the staff is kind of milling around and they don't know what's going on either. And he's locked in his room. Come to find out, Press was so overwhelmed with this situation and the kiss and all that. It started with a kiss. How How did did it end up up like this? this? It was only a kiss. Is asking himself how it ended up like this. Tried to run (laughs) off his fucking crisis. And during his crisis... Because he was in such a crisis, he got a (laughs) migraine and was still running, which his migraine made him dizzy. So he was running while dizzy and he fell and fucked up and sprained his ankle real bad. So this is not the consequences of his actions started with a kiss and it ended like this. If there wasn't a perfect fucking situation for that line is laid up in his bed because he can't fucking move or walk on his foot and his head hurts so bad. So she kind of pokes her way in and he's just like, oh, thank God. I need coffee and I need you to get my computer. (laughs) I can't get up. And she's like, what is going on? I sprained my ankle. Oh, like, what? Oh, well, then we need some light in here so you can see. No! Don't turn the light on. <laughs> I hurt. also have a migraine. Oh, what? She learns the whole story. The migraine thing, I fully get it. I need it d- dark as fucking the night when I have one of those. So, 
it's so funny because she refuses to get his electronics for him. And in fact, instead sends everyone else out of his apartment and is saying, oh, no, he's taking a personal day. Goodbye. Ethan does not take this well, but no. goodbye. Bye-bye. But I like the fact that she like took charge and took all his electronics because, again, with a migraine, those electronics will make it fucking so much worse. And it was also that she printed out all his stuff so that he could still feel because it was important to him to do it. So he still gets some work done because she printed out his stuff and, you know, he rested and he had his little day and it was so cute. And she worked on the computer for him and it was really cute. And they end up ordering pizza for dinner, which she was very impressed by because it wasn't It was so just so fancy. funny. She goes... Oh, do you want me to order it from that like fancy place and I'll go get it? He goes, No, just order it. And she's like Have them deliver what? In-, <laughs> in the box. <laughs> it's, the box. So it's so funny. And then he's like, Oh, I really need a cigarette. Like, oh my god, I wish I had a smoke. She's like, I'll go get them for you. He's like, No, I have some patches in the bathroom. Could you get them for me? This man, after JD's comment went right to the store and he bought all the shit so he could stop smoking because of the fact that JD made such a big deal about being so fucking smug about not quitting smoking. He doesn't want to be the same as this motherfucker. Jesus Christ. So yeah, they're just having a nice time with their pizza and their little moment with the patches and she just builds up the wherewithal to ask him, what would you have said that night? Like, if we hadn't have been interrupted, what would have happened? And apparently he's been waiting for her to ask that for a really long time because instead of responding to her, he says, fucking finally. And then just, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> I mean, the tension has been there, but I think oh yeah, he didn't want to cross a line with her and maybe was just really waiting for her to bring it up. And I think he just snapped. <laughs> he just honestly, he's been off cigarettes for less than a day. I probably would have snapped. <laughs> he's fragile right now. Right. <laughs> so they kiss and then things get even more heated and then they say, Okay, this is just a one time thing. Ride my face. We'll get it out. Bro, I was like This is for you. Oh okay. tonight is just for you. Oh, man, so good. And that was it. That was where, like, it went nowhere else. And it was like, just tonight? Like, okay. Okay. So she didn't like that as much. She wanted to return the favor. So in the shower the next morning, she returns the favor and she says, well, it's still within 24 hours. So it's still the same one-time thing. I mean, that's a loophole. Solid. They are, however, interrupted during this. This was so good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> where this random friend of his that we don't actually meet, he must be from a different book or something, I'm thinking. Why else would he have this random cameo and then have nothing else? But apparently it's his old roommate from college that he still had him as, an, as his emergency contact. So when he went to the hospital for his foot, they called him, which why would you need an emergency contact if you weren't unconscious? That makes no sense if he was able to leave on his own. I don't know weird whole thing was weird this part but this dude randomly walks into his apartment while Rach is going down on him and is talking to him while he's in the shower and yeah she just keeps going so it's all good but then he disappears after that so no harm no foul I guess I mean weird whatevs moving on weird moment we're gonna move on so it's time for another event it is the Middleton University dinner and oh Rach oh Rach she has been dreaming of Middleton University for freaking ever she was going to go to school there originally but when she tried to get an apartment and go to school and stuff that's when she found out that her mom had opened credit cards in her name and fucked up her whole credit and that's when all this whole thing started and her mom came clean and she said you need to come clean and that's when she did and went to prison and yeah being on the campus is so surreal because she's only ever seen it online she's really having an out-of-body experience and 
We've said it before, but we're going to say it again. Press is very observant. And he sees this kind of happening, or as much as he can see it happening. And he decides to skip the dinner and brings her on a tour of the campus, checks it out. We learn about how Press got the job he had, just like we kind of just learned a little bit of insight as to how Rach did. And he was to go to this university for a full ride for soccer. And he supposedly had what it took to go pro at soccer. But the summer right before he was to start college, somebody blew a stop sign and hit him. And he was in a car accident with his friends and he got very injured. He wore his meniscus and suffered a very bad concussion, which is why he gets such bad migraines now. And his friend died in the car. Which is so sad. Yeah. But it is nice to get more backstory with him and learn more about him. And it's kind yeah, of especially showing... since we don't know very much without mm-hmm. his point of view. But it, it is nice because it's kind of showing that their friendship relationship is kind of like evolving mm-hmm. more and more information. So they were joking on their tour about how... It's like an old saying at the college that if lovers kiss on these specific steps, like you're destined for marriage. But they get ready to head back to the dinner. They can't help themselves and they stop and kiss and they just have to be on these steps. But it's very subtle in there. It's not like in your face. Which I do appreciate. Yeah. And they agree to keep things casual between them and continue this kind of sexual back and forth that they've been having until their time is up. And so they have two weeks of fun while they're waiting for Press's ankle to heal. He made it very clear that once his ankle healed, he was going to fuck her. But until then, they've been having two weeks of fun orally. So his crutch is gone. And just like that, instantly, he is at her house. Yeah. And it's funny because all the two weeks that they have been kind of fooling around, if she stayed over, she stayed in the guest room. She was trying to like not infringe on his space or whatever, but he went to her place and he was like, nope, we're we're here. And they did a lot of in-between places. So it wasn't like a lot of, it was just like kind of one night that they were doing their thing. And he did not stay in the guest room because as he says oh i must have missed your guest room that's he's so funny <laughs> he actually he is kind of funny and cute in a lot he of, is in his little, own little neurotic way he has this I little i truly little wish clips. i had his i know i've said it but i truly wish i had his, his yeah me too and like when they wake up in the morning it's so funny i was right you do snore because <laughs> he's joking about that when they were at the grocery store so He has a pep in his step. He is happy and lighter and it is showing even at work. He brings breakfast to work. Well, and everyone is so apartment and everyone's so so fucking confused. They're like, why? (laughs) Why is this here? And Ethan, once again, like a douche fucking nozzle. So, well, first of all, one of the other workers, he brought us food. To be nice? Is he okay? Yesterday he said I was really doing a really great job. I assumed he was being sarcastic. And then the other one's like, me too. And then Ethan turns and looks at Rach. Unacceptable. Just because you're playing around like his girlfriend doesn't mean you can slack off like one. He's supposed to be running errands. You can't even pick up donuts. What can you do? And finally, Rach stands up to Ethan and is basically like, oh my gosh, just shut up. He's like, you can't talk to me like that. And she's like, consider it one of the few things I can do. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to go set out the coffee. And the other workers are all happy about it. And, you know, yep. so it's good shit. So we find out that Press slacked off a little bit purposefully because he would never accidentally fuck something up. Sable had asked him to throw a birthday party. He was in charge of throwing a birthday party. and. It's kind of the next day, and 
he needs Rach to help organize that because he just sent out invitations. So that's good, right? He sent out evites. In case you're curious, they were evites. This is fun, right? A just... Navy saying it's a birthday. <laughs> Rach is like, I guess the theme is Navy. <laughs> and she's like, but what about cake? He's like, white cake, white frosting. Like, you can't do that to somebody. What about sprinkles? He's like, fine, all the sprinkles. So she took that seriously. So she went all out. He even gives her his black Amex card to go run all the errands to get anything she possibly could need for this party and she is like you're gonna give this to me what she knows what a black amex means oh yeah but she takes this job seriously she gets shit done she's pretty impressed with what she was able to accomplish in less than 24 hours she even goes dress shopping and olivia and jamal the other two people who work there even help her pick out a dress it's so cute because They end up buying the dress because she doesn't want to use his Amex for the dress. While as tempting as it is, she doesn't want to be that person. And so she's talking to the sales lady. And I think she also didn't want to try to put forth like the wrong message. Then she runs into the other two and they're like, we're going to buy you this dress. And she goes, you got, you guys can't do that. And they're like, yeah, but work has been great. (laughs) He's not grumpy. And that's because of you. So please let us buy this for you. They know what's going on. A thousand and ten percent. They know what's happening. And so they're trying to buy her a dress that's not conservative. Right. And the goods a little. She's pretty proud of what his apartment looks like by the time she's done. She even managed to get a waterfall balloon garland arch installed in Navy. Because apparently (laughs) the theme of the birthday party is navy so then press realizes he screwed up because in his own unwillingness to throw the party and also unwillingness to kind of ask for help to do such a thing he forgot to mention who the party was for and by then it was kind of too late and now he feels shitty because he kind of blindsided with her with this and oops the party's for press It's a birthday party for him, except it's not actually his birthday. She even says, I am your assistant. I buy your plane tickets. I know for a fact it's not your birthday. I mean, you're so obviously a Capricorn (laughs) and we are in Sagittarius season. Hello. But he's going to be busy on his birthday and it works better for the campaign. Just, I love her. I, (laughs) you're an idiot. This is not your birthday. (laughs) So now the cake's wheeled out, you know, this cake that is. 90% 90% sprinkles and 10% cake that she's like oh fucking shit yeah. and she's like make a wish and he's I wish this cake had more sprinkles dead pants it so of course she's cackling and no one gets it but <laughs> she's just know, like laughing to herself at that point. so they're, they're having a good time yeah well but somebody's having a good time <laughs> the Middleton University Dean to the party he invited so many people for her to specifically network with for the university so while yes it was his birthday he really went out of his way to be such a good dude as aria would call him a good doobie so it's the end of the party and everything's kind of getting cleaned up went on she can tell he's like itching and she she's like you really want to smoke don't you you could just once it's okay like, it's your birthday. And he's like, yeah, but you wouldn't. So no. And he's kind of like, I'm keeping my birthday presents anyways. Because he noticed that in all her adding to his place to make it more homey so that he could have a party there, she added pictures all around his place of them to make it more authentic. And she even added that one that wasn't authorized on his fridge. It was cute. It was so cute. Um, And they kind of just have this cute little moment where, like, are you sure you don't believe in luck? And he's just like, well, I believe in you. Does that count? Because she's such a big believer in luck and a destiny, meeting a person for a reason type of thing. And, I mean, he's so, so super analytical. They have such cute moments. And he's like, stay. And she's like, well, it's your birthday. It's your fake birthday. You can do anything you want. He's like, okay. 
well, I want to clean the kitchen. I can't go to sleep without cleaning the kitchen. <laughs> so they spend time together while he's cleaning the kitchen. Next, we find them. They have to take a plane trip for a little conferency thing. And she's stuck on this plane next to fucking Ethan. I hate him. I'm so sick of this ass wipe. And she kind of just puts her earbuds in and ignores this fucker. But she's sick of him, too. And then he's tapping on his shoulder. And she's like, what? But it's not him. So it's press that comes. And and she goes, what are you doing? Oh, my seat was uncomfortable. Your seat in business class? Really? (laughs) Well, the company was less than desirable. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He just wanted to sit next to her. And then he makes comments about joining the Mile High Club. And helps her through takeoff because she has a hard time. Yeah, he does. He (laughs) uses his hands to help her through takeoff. It's so funny. So I have a big meeting while they're all together. And Sable's all all happy about their numbers and how press is polling well. And he's finally looking likable. And she's like, so you can all say Sable was right. And press is very like concerned. He's like, so nothing should change, right? Nothing at all. Nothing. Everything has to stay the same. And then they start, well, we need to figure out how rage fits in with moving forward. We need to discuss phasing her out before we announce the campaign. At first, press started fighting on it, but Rach found out through this meeting that they need to do a oppo research deep dive. It's basically just if the opposition can research anything about her, anything that could be kind of brought to light to in a negative in a negative way to hinder his ability to become the mayor. So she basically is like, I can't with my mom being a felon, like which because they don't know she's a felon. His whole fucking mayor career thing can't do that. So Just she's go, like, no, nope, it's okay. I'll leave. We knew our time was, you know, it's okay. Mm-hmm. He's not too happy. He mm-hmm. kind of leaves the meeting fast and is like, fuck this shit. So she shows up at his door with a letter of resignation. And he's not happy. And his main focus is how she could have possibly printed this out and give them the tone. He doesn't understand that there's a possibility that she could have done this at the hotel. That's his main focus. He can't. It's funny. And she's like, it's not about you. I, it's like, it's okay. I'll find a replacement. It's fine. We can stay friends. He's like, sure. I'm going to bed. Have a good night, buddy. And this then her fucking the baby die for the record. I had I'm... to read it like five times. That's why I'm trying to read it out loud now. I could laugh so And then hard. he shut the door. One second passed. Good. I thought exactly how I wanted that to go. Two seconds thought. It literally couldn't have gone any better. Has the third long, painful second passed. I held up my fist to knock right as he opened the door. Buddy, I said indignantly, pushing the door open. I know, so fucking stupid, he said and pulled me inside. (laughs) Read it three times because it was so funny. (laughs) What the fuck just happened? She's like, I wasn't sure how post-breakup conversation from fake, fake relationship was supposed to go, but making out against a hotel door wasn't really my first guess. So, I mean, it was her two week notice. So, I mean, I guess they still have two weeks left. I mean... So, they start to get it on. But, and this is probably one of the funnier moments of this book, I'm just saying, because he was all upset because he didn't have any condoms. And then she's like, Well, I packed for you. Here's one. And then she opens it up, and the she fucking drops it on the floor. And she's like, oh, no, it's fine. Do you think it's still okay, right? There is like, lint on it. I am not using something that was on the floor. No, the last time this carpet was clean. <laughs> what the fuck? I thought you wore a germaphobe. <laughs> She's like dangling it towards him. <laughs> He's like jerky way. Do not touch me with that. <laughs> Don't be such a dictator. I'm coming to prevent STDs and stuff. Come on. <laughs> He's like, throw it away. 
he didn't pack any more. Like, what the fuck? He just, I wasn't that optimistic. <laughs> it was a work trip. Like, how much time did you think you were going to have? Yeah. So then they go down to the gift shop to try to get more. So let's just say the gift shop did not have any. But they had chess. So they end up playing chess, playing chess. together. <laughs> And then cuddling. He learns a little bit more about her because she talks about how she learned to play chess and she played chess with her mom. And she kind of brings in a little bit of her past and it kind of hints as to like how poor she really was because they didn't have a full chess board growing up, which was cool. So they cuddle together and when they wake up, he wants to take a photo with her. Not a publicity photo, just a photo. And in the background, you can see their chessboard, you can see their room kind of a mess, and you can see the torn up resignation letter. And they take the cutest little picture. And it's just so cute because I'm assuming, I read from this that he uploaded it, right, with the caption checkmate on it. Yeah. It was cute. And he never uploads stuff ever to social media himself. So that was really fucking cute. She's still kind of confused and a mess from this whole thing, and they go home, and he ends up, like, staying the night again at her place when they go home, which is even more kind of bizarre, and even more bizarre is when she wakes up in the morning to him attempting to make her breakfast. It does not go well. <laughs> he doesn't cook, and it's everything that he does just such adorable things. When he really has no idea what to do. And he has brought over the VIP binder, but it's no longer the VIP binder. He has turned it into the Middleton University binder for her and best way around that. It's super cute. So she should have known it was too good to be true because they go off to work and she walks into work and Ethan is there. And Ethan insists that he needs to talk to press in private. And she just knows that she the jig knows is up. what's about to happen. Basically, Ethan did all the back research and l- learned about her mother, and he was going to present it to him. He's and not in a nice way either. No, because he is not a nice man. He's basically like, I told you she was bad news. Her mom's a felon. She's bad. She's just here to get you. I told you. He's just a super douche nugget, obviously, because he spent the whole time. And press is just basically like, get out of my office. And and Ethan's sitting there all smug and thinking that he's kicking her out of the office. And he goes, no, you get out of my office. And Ethan is, but your yes. phone. I'm not my father. Get the fuck fuck out. And Press is so stressed out by all this. And she's like, thanks. And Press starts to explain, I have a migraine. You've done enough. I need a personal day. I need you to go. So when she comes back, he's still kind of weird with her. She's like, you know, we need to talk kind of thing. And he's like, we need to get to work. There's lots to do. She's like, I guess that's a no on talking. He's like, I need my Amex card back. Which kind of hits her a little, especially after learning all of what her mother has done. She definitely takes that a bit to heart, him taking the Amex back. Which yeah. I don't blame her for either. Oh, I would absolutely feel the exact not. same way. And we learn all about what happened with her mom because of all of Ethan's rants and about her attempts at, you know, apologizing and whatnot. I guess she had cleaned all these houses and had access to all their credit card offers in the mail and all that. In addition to what she did for Rach, she opened up all these credit cards and people's names and thought she could pay it back with all her money-making schemes, but obviously it never panned out. So Ethan's been canned. Everything's in a mess. This whole thing with the mom, PR is coming. But while Sable's there, Rach is like, I need your help professionally and she talks to sable and tries to figure out a plan what's best case scenario kind of thing and then press comes in and sable for all of being a pr person does not handle that situation well because she just basically like yells to press like you're being dumped yeah what the fuck? 
I mean, um, she probably had such a love for her and was just like, you're being a fucking idiot. Well, that, and I don't think she truly thought that they were actually that much together until um, yes. a little bit into right. this. So Rach follows Press into his room because he kind of storms off and she tries to give him her resignation again. And he's like, I don't agree to it. And she's like, it's not up to you. And they kind of go back and forth and it gets really heated and really mean and not cool. It just ends with him telling her that you're a liar and a fake. And she says, well, you're unlikable and I quit. And yeah, those words were not something that he should have said because those absolutely stuck with her. He's putting words to feelings that she was scared he would think of her this whole time and especially if he had learned about her past and everything that was definitely something she was scared about and here he is putting it out in the universe yeah so a week later she gets a call from daddy senator's assistant who wants a meeting because of course he does she goes to his house for a meeting it's really strange but she does it this dude's really weird you think but he thinks that Press is out to get his job and I'm pretty sure he's scared of his son. And he basically promises Rach anything she could want for one teeny tiny interview. We're going to do it the day before Press's announcement. It'll be great. So then fast forward to the day of the interview, which isn't too far away, but it's not specified. And during the interview, it becomes apparent very quickly that the questions that the reporter is asking are not the questions that she was prepped with, that she was told to prepare for. And they're pretty much questions that are going to paint press in a very bad light. And clearly the paint, entire segment. Yeah, basically paint her as not only just like a woman scorned, but that he's a shitty person. He is person. not the mayor for anyone. Right? Exactly. Yeah. That there are a lot of interviews lined up to prove that. Exactly. And, you know, there are interviews about people who no longer work there. It's shady as shit. It's politics, and baby. Who's behind it? Weird, daddy senator. So she is overwhelmed by all this and has a complete meltdown telling her truth. And, and I like her because the they, of- they try to interrupt her and she goes, I am not done. Let me continue. And I'm like, you wanted this interview. You wanted my truth. You're going to get it. You're going to get it all in one shot and shut the fuck up. Um, And towards the end of her spewing meltdown, (laughs) press barges into the set, covered in trash, by the way, (laughs) with Sable quick on his heels. Mm -hmm. So apparently the news station contacted press's PR regarding the allegations against him so he comes straight in what did you do to her what do you what did you say to her and he's like and by the way the doors near your dumpsters are clearly not very safe if they can be easily broke into or whatever (laughs) the whole thing it should be noted too the way she's dressed his dad's team is the one who dressed her and it's super tight fitting it's very low so basically her tits are out and from the comment that too. Sable makes, you can tell that it is cold. <laughs> but it's so funny because every time Pratt opens his mouth, Sable is saying something to try to make it sound somewhat okay. It's so funny. <laughs> like, what did you put? Like, you, she did not dress. Like, what, what did you put? He's not saying that he thinks that he should have a say in what she's wearing. He's just concerned about her being chilly. She obviously looks very cold. Uh, <laughs> she's just trying her hardest. And he's just um, losing his damn mind. <laughs> and then the senator's assistant starts yelling. This is a close set. You better be recording him acting like an ass. Like this is a prime example. And then Rage gets off. You can't twist the truth. and starts to walk after her. When suddenly now we're in a circus book because there just happens to be a banana peel on set. So, okay. Um, So it came in with him on his clothes with the trash. Oh, okay. So she starts to take a step while she's talking towards the assistant and she slips on the banana peel and goes fucking down swinging. Not really swinging. It's just 
Sugar, we're going down swinging. If you don't say that when you're saying going down, then you're a loser. Just saying. Sorry. not sorry. So she just grabs the nearest thing she can to try to stabilize herself, which happens to be Press's shirt. Oh, baby. Enter Peckgate. So, so good, though. But I mean, come on. On camera, he is now shirtless and upset and looking at her and then just has this super impassioned speech like, I don't want to be mayor more than I want you. Like, I nothing is worth it if I don't have you. But it's just such an impassioned speech. And Rach just starts laughing at him, he which loses it. Doesn't go that well. No. It's really kind of funny because she, she's like, what the fuck? And she goes, I'm so lucky. I have video evidence of this forever. She goes, happy birthday, by the way. I guess your birthday's just as fun as mine. Oh. And he's like, winning doesn't matter if it's not with you. And so then the book fucking ends. Yeah. Just like that. And we get an epilogue mm-hmm. where she's been visiting her mom in jail because press has been kind of encouraging her to do so. We learned that Peck Gate went over really well. Yeah, it did. Um, and went over almost just as well as Boobgate with the voters. So and you have that, two hot people without shirts on. And that she applied to Middleton University and got accepted. Mm-hmm. And that he, shock and awe, won the mayor race. And that's honestly, I'm totally faking it. Yeah. Who is your favorite character? I really like Sable, the PR lady, a lot. And I liked the two main characters. How about yourself? I feel like if I had Press's point of view, Mm -hmm. I feel like he would have super sold me on my favorite, and he probably would have been one of my favorite book boyfriends this month. Mm -hmm. He was good. I truly enjoyed him. And that's what makes me so sad that I didn't get to get in his head. But I loved him, and I liked Sable. Yeah. But your least. Oh, boy. Who do I pick? (laughs) There's quite a few of them. JD sucks. Press's dad sucks. sucks. Ethan and sucks. Ethan sucks. <laughs> Ethan sucks, sucks, sucks. Yeah, I think Ethan was the worst of them all. I hated them all. JD just really put her down a lot. And then his dad was just so fucking shady. It was like the trifecta of fucking people that I the just men. hated. Hey, at least yeah. you hated men this time. I know. Solid. Have, who was yours? I agree. Oh, okay. I agree. Uh, I super, yeah. That's good. So Amazon gives it a 4.4 and Goodreads is a 4.2. Where did you say? What did you rate this? Oh, Oh, you're fine. Um, I gave this a 3.5. So one, I wish I had Press's point of view. Two, for me, the writing could have been cleaned up in places and could have been better. Some of the sentences were structured really funny. For instance, I highlighted a few. I don't mind to bake one it, instead of saying, I don't mind baking one. Cause Got it was like at, entering something in a contest. There were a couple errors, but not really, but things worked technically. But for me, the way a couple sentences were structured, I just felt like they were on just a lesser end of what I was looking for if that makes sense and I felt like the ending was a little odd and rushed compared to the rest of the book because the pacing of the rest of the book was good throughout and then I felt like the end didn't fully match up I also gave it a 3.5 I do wish it was dual POV but I just really like dual POV a lot yeah Um, and that's why it's just because selfishly just want to be in the other person's head I did like it a lot. I laughed throughout the whole thing. But it was and funny. It was cute. Yeah. It was. I do agree on the rushed ending as well. I have found that like we've run into that a lot with some books lately that we've read together is it just feels like all of a sudden they're like, shit, we need a resolution. I've even ha- run into that a lot with my own personal books that I've been reading. So I don't know why. But anyways, <laughs> other than that, I like the story. It's all the tropes I enjoy, so that was <laughs> nice. It it was good. I did I did thoroughly enjoy it. I just it, there was just those few things for me that would have bumped it up higher, but it's still like a three point five. So you know, still really good. What was your cucumber rating? I was gonna go probably about a four. I mean, th- we had a couple that were just fucking hilarious. That was, 
that's yeah. funny I do enjoy that I just <laughs> wanted more from it because I've read yeah. plenty of rom-coms where there is still the smut in there and while like it was fine it just it wasn't memorable for me I guess is the problem and it wasn't put in there to be like super spicy it was more in there to be like funny in there cutesy in there which was totally fine I also agree for a four because so much of the sexual tension was throughout I would have more of a bang we agree on a cucumber rating yeah this never happens enjoy is it a full moon outside it actually is a full moon there you go Um, that's why we agree (laughs) ask me how I know that today the day that all the children came back from Thanksgiving break (laughs) on a full moon so yeah it's nice to have a little rom com stuff. Yeah, to kind of break up the, break up everything. Different and stuff we got going, yeah. You know. Especially since we've been trying to add so much variety to things. Yeah, and you know, coming towards the end of the year and knowing the last three months of the year are just stressful, it's a nice change of pace. All right, and if I don't sound like super garbage and you can actually hear me, yay for getting through this because my headset like died halfway through. Wheel of Fate time. You ready? Here we go. So the wheel has chosen Corrupt by Penelope Douglas. It's a dark romance. Shocking. It has Erica. I was told that dreams were our heart's desires. My nightmares, however, became my obsession. His name is Michael Christ. My boyfriend's older brother, is like that scary movie that you peek through your hand to watch. He's handsome, strong, and completely terrifying. The star of his college basketball team, and now gone pro. He's more concerned with the dirt on his shoe than with me. But I noticed him. I saw him. I heard him. The things that he did. The deeds that he hid. For years, I bit my nails, unable to look away. Now I've graduated high school and moved on to college, but I haven't stopped watching Michael. He's bad. And the dirt I've seen isn't content to stay in my head anymore because he's finally noticed me. Her name is Erica Fane, but everyone calls her Rika. My brother's girlfriend grew up hanging around my house and is always at our dinner table. She looks down when I enter a room and stills when I'm close. I can always fear the, feel the fear rolling off her. And while I haven't had her body, I know that I have her mind. That's all I really want anyway. Until my brother leaves for the military and I find Rika alone at college in my city, unprotected. The opportunity is too good to be true, as well as timing. Because you see, three years ago, she put a few of my high school friends in prison, and now they're out. We've waited, we've been patient, and now every one of her nightmares will come true. Corrupt is a standalone dark romance with no cliffhanger. It is suitable for ages 18 and up. Well, you have been training for this, Crystal. I know. It's probably going to be kind of bully romancy, I have a feeling. Right. Which... It is also 516 pages long. It is a chonker. So join us next week for Corrupt by Penelope Douglas. And keep reading. And keep it smutty.